Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Cryptids and Monsters video. Alright, let's go ahead with part 2 of chapter 8 from the Occult Investigator Real Cases from the Files of Ex-Investigations book by Bob Johnson. This one again titled The Salem Witch Connection. Last time we had done part 1, we had left it off with regards to a trip. In this case, going over to the Salem, Massachusetts area, and there was descriptions associated with one of the guests there, Mario, describing his encounter with what looks like to be a witch and some of the bad things that were happening there. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's continue part two here, and then I'll give my own thoughts and opinions on it afterward. Let me know what you guys think about this chapter two. So far, it's pretty interesting when it comes to the world of Salem and it comes to the world of witches as well. So here's part two. The case assumes some paranormal merit at this point. When Mario excused himself to use the bathroom, I told Savannah that the case sounded interesting but not solid enough to justify devoting a lot of our time. When Mario returned, I told him that his experience could be explained in a number of ways. Maybe the witch slipped him some sort of hallucinogenic Mickey, or perhaps it had been a hysterical reaction to the overwhelming Salem sense of the occult. It's rare but not impossible that you and Julie would both have the same experience, but you haven't told us enough to warrant conducting a serious investigation, I said. But that was just the beginning, Robert. I didn't tell you what we saw, what was happening ever since. This is the real problem, not just that moment. It's the ghost of the sheriff that is ruining my life, Mario continued. On the short plane ride from New York to Logan International Airport in Boston, I went over to the particulars of the case with Silvana. During the odd time shift Mario had experienced at the back of the Joshua Ward house, he claimed that he had actually seen some kind of ethereal being racing across the grounds where he stood in, or stood frozen. The being had slammed an axe through the back door and then ran screaming through the house. The ghostly apparition then settled in the window of the house and grinned at Mario, as if to indicate that he would be his next victim. Mario had been transfixed by the image and can sense pure evil as it stared him in the eye from behind of the panes of glass. He described the face of the being as wrinkled, twisted with evil, with a gray-yellow pallor. The gray-haired witch was laughing and cackling frantically as though she was a deranged puppeteer pulling the specter strings. What seemed to Mario like nearly a half hour had actually lasted only a few minutes, according to his wristwatch. When it was over, he felt extremely tired as though he hadn't slept for days. Once he cleared his senses, Mario had had a serious argument with the gray-haired witch over Julie leaving the tour group to join the coven in a ritual it planned for midnight that evening. Mario was not invited, but the older woman was adamant that Julie joined them despite his strong objections. As their argument grew more heated, the witch took Mario, I'm sorry, the witch told Mario that what they had experienced at the back of the ward house was the result of a spell she had cast to demonstrate her power to Julie. The woman said that her coven, an ancient sect of Celtic Wiccans whose ancestors had settled in Salem in the 1600s, had an intense magical hold on the area and could control the powers of this world and the next to do their bidding. It appeared as though Julie had been chosen to be a new recruit and that Mario just happened to be an unwanted bystander who was standing in her way. Mario later learned that the spell the woman had cast was not performed simply to impress Julie, but in fact had been a more malevolent purpose, to conjure the ghost of Salem's infamous high sheriff to do her bidding. Mario told us that according to the witch, during the witch trials when the sheriff had condemned one of the coven's ancestors to death, the accused witch cursed the sheriff and bound his spirit to answer to the wishes of her generations to come for all eternity. Mario feared that because he and the gray-haired woman had argued so vehemently about allowing Julie to attend the midnight ceremony, she might be angry enough to make him the target of the sheriff's ghost. Silvana shuffled through our notes and read off a list of problems that Mario had faced since his return from Salem. We needed to address these one by one in order to determine which obstacles might actually be the result of paranormal influence. And the list contained the following. Number one. 
He experienced recurring, bizarre, extremely vivid dreams centering on Salem. The dreams always depicted screaming people, fire, black-walled enclosures, and frantic running from house to house. Number two, notice that missing items from Mario's apartment all were somehow connected to his trip to Salem. Number three, strange odors, odors of earth and sea on Mario's person and clothing. Number four, flashes of wispy light and orbs of light streaking through his apartment. And number five, stopped from visiting Julie at her home on three different occasions because of car trouble, weather, and sickness. Mario had the most intense and disturbing experience the second night after his return from Salem. He arrived at the apartment at about 11.45 after a date with Julie. It had been a rather unpleasant evening. Julie had berated him for arguing with that gray-haired woman on the ghost tour. He decided to try to let it go and to get a good night's sleep, but that wouldn't be so easy. He had fallen asleep quickly enough, but it was a labored sleep. He had been twisting and turning and feeling very cold despite being bundled under the blankets. When he awoke from his restlessness, he noticed the distinct smell of sea air in his pitch-dark room. He sat up frantically, searching for the switch on his bedside lamp. If he looked toward the corner window of his bedroom, Mario knew he could see a glimmer of streetlight to guide him, but he realized in sudden horror that he could not open his eyes. No matter how hard he tried, he could not raise his eyelids. He was blind in the pitch dark, and the normal brain control mechanism that opened his eyes thousands of times a day was not working. He was powerless to see. He grabbed at his eyes with his fingers, trying to pry open the lids, but he could not budge them. He put one hand on top of his eyes and the other below and stretched his skin so his eyes would open. But despite tiny tears in the corner of his eyes, he could still not get them to open. He could feel blood trickle down his fingers from where he had stretched the skin around his eyes to the breaking point, And he hoped the lubrication might help them open, but his eyes remained shut. Exhausted and frightened, he lay back in bed and then heard a sickening laugh ringing in his ears. Pray for death, your hell is here on earth. He could not explain what happened next other than to say he had fallen asleep again. He awoke the next morning, sight restored, in sweat-dried sheets. This bizarre event caused Mario to become obsessed with the legend of the High Sheriff in an effort to rid himself of his haunting. He had done hours of research on the web, but despite the volume of information he compiled on his computer's hard drive and the hundreds of pages of printouts of everything he found, every bit of information had somehow been lost, misplaced, or accidentally destroyed. We always approach a case as skeptics, and one of the first methods is to try to determine if odd events are anything more than mere coincidence. So before we left our investigation to Salem, we scrutinized Mario's claims and even conducted our own acid test. We found the complimentary postcard from the Salem men stashed in his suitcase. We asked him to identify the postcard, which he did without suspicion. Without telling Mario, we then hid the postcard behind a picture on the wall. On a later visit, that postcard was gone. Of course, we asked Mara if he had found it while cleaning and said he hadn't. He said that he was wondering about the postcard's whereabouts because he wanted to send it to relatives back to Italy. This was a minor test, but it corroborated Mario's claims and fit with the mysterious events surrounding Mario's dilemma. During our drive from Logan to Salem, Silvana admitted to me that she had never visited the town, not so much because she never had the opportunity, but more because she had heard that there were many disturbed spirits in the area, and her pre-cognitive abilities often warned her to stay away. It was obvious that Silvana was becoming antsy in the rental car as she revealed her uneasiness about Salem. She repeatedly mentioned that Mario's problem was probably not a paranormal event at all, probably in a half-hearted attempt to quell her apprehension. I asked her if she would rather not go into town, but she insisted that although she felt some ominous warnings, her job, our job, was to flush out the cause of Mario's disturbance. But Savannah's instincts were always on the money, so I knew that if she was spooked, then we were in for a case for the books. I was all at once jazzed that we had a real event on the hook, while at the same time worried that we could be messing with powers much stronger than we had yet experienced. Our first stop in Salem was Crow Haven Corner to find 
the gray-haired witch. Although Lori Cabot no longer owned the shop that sits on the corner adjacent to the town commons and across from the tourist-heavy witch museum, I was able to locate Lance, a longtime employee and student of the paranormal who had helped me with information for a number of other cases in the New England area. It wasn't long before we dug up the person we sought. Her name was Jazael, the high priestess of a Dianic Wiccan cove that operated on the outskirts of Salem proper. Unlike almost any other town in America, in Salem, one can find a Wiccan high priestess faster than a local dentist. And with a local who's connected to the occult network, those results are immediate. We had lunch with Lance in a local pub and I felt glad to be in Salem again. Even under these circumstances, I was also glad that Lance and Savannah had connected on some psychic level because she was beginning to feel more comfortable about being in the area. Lance told us that although Jezel was well known in town, most people didn't know any real details about her other than that her family had been original Salem settlers and her coven members did not speak of her to anyone in town. The Dianic coven that Jezel ruled was for women only and it was rumored to be a lesbian sect. But what made us really take notice was what Lance revealed just before biting into his tuna sandwich. Jazael's sect recruited only Salem natives or those whose ancestors could be directly traced to the town. Our call to Vincent's office that afternoon confirmed what we had suspected. Thanks to the speed of the internet and Vincent's detective database, a trace of Julie's family history did indeed lead straight to Salem, something that Julie herself probably didn't know. Her family had been early settlers well documented in Massachusetts records as book binders. There was, however, one black mark on the family record that appeared to be more of a missing item than a formal note. A member of Julie's family had some difficulties with the local magistrate in 1658, but the details were suspiciously omitted. The computer report simply read, The true confession has purged the offense. It is common knowledge that during the witch hunts of that era, if a person was accused of being a witch and confessed, she was usually released, as long as she was willing to give details about other known witches and their ceremonies. This, of course, begged the question of whether Julie's ancestor was a witch stoolie or if it, we were making a bad assumption. But what we did know was that Jezel had discovered Julie's past by some unknown or occult means. I now ruled out any coincidence in this matter because the entire case was weaving together too perfectly. Jezel wanted Julie as part of her coven. Mario was in the way during the ghost tour and was continuing to see Julie. But Savannah reminded me of the Joshua Ward house and questioned how or why that was a piece of the strange puzzle. The obvious connection was the ghost of the High Sheriff. If Jezel could in fact control the spirit through her spell castings and let it loose on Mario... That could explain his current problems. It was becoming clear that a ghost bound to Salem witches sect was haunting Mario. Now all that we had to do was to have Jazel remove the spell and then set Mario free. But first, we had to be convinced that this ghost was real. Lance, our Salem operative, managed to arrange a meeting for us with Jazel under the guise that we were New York television producers willing to pay big money for an on-air interview with a real witch. Although those in the occult take their practices very seriously, money still has its own special powers in the material world. We began asking very general questions about Waika and Salem and then moved into the witch trials and the ghost of the high sheriff. Dazel's calm demeanor became a bit ruffled when we mentioned that we heard of a legend that claimed because of the sheriff's heinous crimes against witches and suspected witches, his spirit was magically bound by a local coven. She said that there are many strange things in Salem, and those who are that curious need to discover the proof for themselves. I cannot confirm nor deny that we as witches have hold over ethereal beings. Let's just say it's our little secret, Jezel said. I then asked her if she knew of a cult lore that said if a witch's curse is made known, she must admit it to the Inquisitor and give the de details. She said that, that was, uh, she was aware of such a message, at which time Silvana broke in and challenged Jezel. We know you are trying to make Julie a member of your coven, and you have used the high share of ghosts to make trouble for Julie's boyfriend, Mario. She then went on to describe Mario's recounting of the ghost tour spell and how he felt he was suspended in time and how he saw a crazed entity running through the Joshua Ward house. 
Savannah's sudden burst of enthusiasm surprised me, but I was glad that we ended the charade so quickly. Jazelle turned her head and said that she had the power to curse and that we should believe what we wanted, but she warned us not to interfere. We wouldn't want to get in the way of a loosed spirit known to be a murderer. I reminded Jazelle that there are many powerful magicians in the world and also reminded her of the witch's read that states, and it harmed none. Do what thou wilt. If she were bent on doing harm to Mario in a selfish effort to gain a new member of a coven, there would be a price to pay down the line. We had hoped that this encounter would convince Jazelle to call off her ghost, if in fact she was the catalyst for Mario's problems. We called him at his apartment the next morning and told him of what we had learned in our confrontation with Jazelle and about Julie's family tree. We were happy to hear that although his hauntings had been chronic, since last evening he hadn't experienced any weird occurrences. The timing curiously coincided with our talks with Jazael and that made us hopeful that perhaps she had lifted whatever spell she might have cast on Silvana's friend. But as good as everything sounded, I remained curious about the happenings at the Joshua Ward house. After all, it had been a hotbed of a rumor, legend, and ghostly activity for years. I convinced Savannah that although... We should take a ride to the house before we made our back, way back to New York. It was about 4 p.m. when we finally settled our bill at the Hawthorne Hotel at the Salem Commons and then drove the short distance to the Ward House. Silvana said to me, so this is the famous spooky house, eh? It doesn't look as scary to me. It has a nice not brick building with nice window drapes. I had to agree. It didn't look very ominous in the afternoon light and I was also a little disappointed by its rather tame presence. I didn't feel particularly creepy, and Savannah's psychic sensitivity wasn't sounding any alarms. So I took out my Nikon camera and began snapping some photos for posterity's sake, and also to keep in Mario's file. I shot some photos on the front of the house and of the signage, and then I remembered that Mario's event had taken place at the back of the house. We ventured back there to shoot a few stills. It looked peaceful enough, and I was confident that this case could be put to bed. A week later, I telephoned Mario to check in, and he happily said everything seemed back to normal. He was still seeing Julie, and her obsession with Salem appeared to have been overshadowed by a new interest in yoga. I mentioned to him that we theorized that the ghost of the high sheriff might have been the poltergeist that was playing havoc with his life, and we hoped that our talk with Jazael had convinced her to back off. So she really was a witch who cursed me because I liked Julie, Mario asked. I told him that it looked that way, especially considering how things were settling down after our confrontation with Jazael. As I hung up, Silvano walked into the office and handed me the package of photos from our one-hour photo that I had taken at the Joshua Ward house. I quickly shuffled through the pictures, which also included shots of the Salem Town Square and various points of interest. The Ward House photos were at the back of the pack, and I nearly dropped them to the floor when I saw the results. Two of the pictures contained ghostly wisps of light that streaked around the house. One photo showed an ominous specter standing in the window. I asked Savannah to take a look at what I believed to be spirits caught on film, and she said, Ah, the High Sheriff is back where he belongs. Then that's it. That's the end of Chapter 8 of the book Occult Investigator, Real Cases from the Files of Ex-Investigations by Bob Johnson. Again, the title is The Salem Witch Connection. So let's briefly talk about that here. What about that in this case? There was a chapter, huh? Here we had an ending, finally, when it came to the previous chapters, having more of an ambiguous set of circumstances or at least resolutions. Here it turns out that the woman, in this case Julie, the woman that uh, Mario was in love with, she was someone that was a long past ancestor, like her ancestors were from Salem. And they, in this case, she was a long future relative from them. And lo and behold, it looks like that that woman, that Wiccan witch, that Jazael, was in turn wanting to have her in their coven, even then maybe for other reasons as well. But she saw Mario as being in the way, and he continued to be in the way too. I think this is the first time within my playlist that I've ever talked about the idea of someone taking a ghost and then using them almost as a weapon. Because here in this case, we heard about Jezael 
essentially using that sheriff featured within the house itself, that Joshua Ward house, and how she was almost sicking him on Mario. Whatever was happening with Mario during the nighttime and whatever was happening during the day as well, which was kind of scary when you think about it, the idea that he couldn't open his eyelids. And then as far as these lights and shadows and then things disappearing and reappearing and so on, it seemed like she, and this was far away in this case from the Salem area, he was back at his apartment, shows the power of these ghosts, right? So in this case, it looks like Jazael absolutely had unleashed that sheriff onto Mario as a way to try to get him to back off. It was interesting to see too that it almost took almost like some kind of, I don't know if you could call it a rule or some other type of 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 declaration, something that states that if one witch is doing something bad, that in turn if there's something else to kind of come down the line that she has to pay the price for. That's what it made it sound like, and that's essentially what caused her to back off afterward. Anyone else heard of that by any chance? As far as witches and so on, having that kind of strict, almost honor code, if lack of a better term, again, and maybe something else uh, is a better description, let me know. I have had actually people in the comments before when I've done videos on witches uh, mentioned as well that they are in turn witches too, and they go over some information about what I mentioned in the video. So anyone listening to the video that happens to be along those lines, uh, let me know as well what you thought of this chapter and then what the circumstances were there. But otherwise, a uh, pretty satisfying end to the chapter. And then um, interesting too about the Joshua Ward House. I just featured that because of this chapter. I did a video on it as well. So check it out when you have a chance. I'll include the link for it below. And I talked more about the ghosts associated with that sheriff. Who knew that in this case, the sheriff actually had a very very vengeful streak that he could almost be used almost like a bulldog of sorts so interesting stuff all right everybody thanks again as always take care